Now, what about the sutures that are placed in the flexor tendons and the strength of those sutures? That is in large part what we are depending on to hold the tendon together during movement. Flexor tendons are repaired with two different sutures. There's the core suture that goes through the mid portion of the tendon, grabbing an outer part of the tendon, and then going back through the core portion again. And there is a final suture, once the core suture is in place and the ends have been pulled together, of taking a suture and just picking up the epitenon, which is the covering of the tendon, and sewing those edges together all the way around. The core suture strength is intended to be such that it can withstand early motion, and it is also intended for the bulk of it to be hidden between the tendon ends so that it does not increase bulk and therefore increase resistance. The number of strands crossing between the tendon ends determine the description of the suture. This would be a four strand repair. It happens to be a cruciate design to the suture. And this is a two strand and it's called a modified Kessler suture. So a two strand, four strand, six strand repair, eight strand repair refers to the number of strands of suture crossing from one tendon to another through the core. Here we see that you can have as many as eight and increasing the number of sutures crossing the core does increase the strength. The problem is it also increases the bulk. Additional characteristics of the core suture that are very important is that the size of the suture itself, the caliber, at least be a 4.0 suture. When the needle goes through the tendon, comes to the outside of the tendon and goes back in, it should have at least a 2 millimeter width that it grabs of the tendon. If it grabs less than that, it is prone to pull out. So the technique of the surgeon is very important in grasping the tendon with the suture. Amount of purchase, meaning the depth to which the suture goes and how much of the tendon it actually grabs as it pulls it to the other end is very important. If this suture only went to here, grabbed a small amount, went across and grabbed a small amount, it would be a very weak suture. So 7 to 10 millimeters on each side of the tendon is required for the minimum core suture strength. There are many different designs for peripheral sutures. It's simply a matter of how the suture crosses over the tendon edges that are being met, whether it's one strand, simple running, or a variety of cross-stitch or other designs. But all of these sutures have one purpose. That is to help smooth the tendon out, to keep it as small as possible, and to not allow the ends of the tendon to gap apart. With the core suture in the middle, something needs to hold the edges of the tendon together. Now we've all seen these illustration of flexor tendons which look like extremely neat and absolutely precise ways to sew things together. But in this photograph on your bottom right, this is a cadaver example of a surgeon placing both a core and a peripheral suture. In this case the sutures are colored so the illustration is clearer to the viewer. But that's the only difference. The tendon is soft and pliable and it is impossible to place a suture in a flexor tendon and not create some bulk because as you're pulling this together you're squeezing the tendon and the tendon 
will tend to bulge out in response to that. Let's review all the variables about the suture that can influence the strength of the repair. You may be thinking to yourself, but how do I know? Well, you don't know unless you ask, but this is very important information to understand as a baseline for how eager you are to begin more vigorous motion. The number of strands is very relevant. The tension of the repair, in other words, was there gapping of the repair uh, seen in the operating room? We'll talk a bit more about that. The amount of tendon that the core suture is able to grab or purchase, the locking or grasping of the suture so that it grabs enough tendon, the diameter of the suture locks, the size of the suture or caliber, the type of suture material, some is stronger than others, whether or not peripheral sutures are in place, and as we will learn as we proceed, the curvature of the tendon path will alter the demands on the suture and that can make a difference in how much the pull is being applied to the suture. And lastly, but certainly not least, is whether or not there are clean, uninjured tendon ends that have been sewn together. If the tendon ends have been traumatized by the initial injury, their holding capacity is greatly diminished and that alone will weaken the repair regardless of the other variables. So it may be helpful to keep in mind that the strength of the suture does not increase in the early weeks and the strength actually decreases as the finger flexes. This is because as the finger flexes often you're not pulling straight on the tendon, but you're placing that suture at an angle and you're pulling the proximal part at an angle compared to the distal part. Also, softening of tendons that have been traumatized in the injury will decrease their holding power. So our conclusions about suture strength are that a core suture strength is determined primarily by the number of strands, and as they increase, so does the strength. But as we saw, there are also a number of other variables. The peripheral suture adds smoothness, and it also adds some strength. But there are many variables that determine suture strength. It is important for you as a therapist treating the patient to know as much as possible about the type of suture and all the variables that relate to suture strength. In particular, it would be useful to know whether the tendon ends have been uninjured at the time of repair. This information usually can be found in the operative note, and I would urge you to always seek out and carefully read the operative note prior to treatment of your patient. Now let's for a moment consider the role of pulleys in the flexor tendon system. As we know, there are two locations of pulleys, the very intricate and complex digital pulleys where there are multiple annular and cruciate pulleys to hold the flexor tendons against the bone, many of which have been excised in this illustration. And there's also the tenacious flexor retinaculum at the wrist, which creates the carpal tunnel that keeps the flexor tendons from bowstringing at the level of the wrist. Pulleys are both a blessing and a curse when it comes to flexor tendon repair because they provide maximum mechanical efficiency. When the tendon glides proximally, they transmit that glide perfectly into joint motion because the pulleys hold the tendon against the bone. But the problem is that the pulleys also provide a friction point. And as you're pulling the flexor tendon proximally with the muscle, the pulley is constraining the tendon and the friction between the two increases. 
the more the flexion, the more this friction. We'll talk about that more momentarily. Now historically, the large A2 annular pulley and the somewhat shorter A4 annular pulley were believed to be required in order to obtain normal digital flexion. And therefore, all efforts were made to retain these pulleys because it was felt that otherwise it would be at the expense of functional flexion of the finger. But more recently, Tang's work has suggested that we should consider modifying the pulley system in order to assure excellent glide of that repair flexor tendon. This includes an incision in the midline that makes the pulley larger, or perhaps the same incision laterally that makes it larger, or it may be removing a portion of the pulley and making the pulley shorter but not totally eliminating the pulley. Tang in a recent publication has suggested that there are suitable pulley incisions that are acceptable to retain function. Here you see the examples of the A4 being expendable now fully. It can include a bit of C2, C3, or both C2 and C3. But the important thing I think to note is none of these recommended incisions include the A3 pulley. In all of these examples, the A3 pulley remains intact. The central pulley in the finger that is closest to the PIP joint. As we said, a loss of a pulley creates bowstringing and requires more tendon excursion. It's difficult enough for us to gain proximal excursion in the normal biomechanics, and we don't want to increase the demands on excursion. Tang also suggests that it is unsuitable to include A3 or to go proximal to A3 with any incision. So our conclusions are that a pulley loss creates a mechanical inefficiency. The tendon pulling against the pulley creates maximum friction and that friction is greatest at full flexion. And Tang has provided us information that a limited loss of pulley can still maintain functional range of motion for flexion. 